This is a story about a dude named Lane. He moved to the mainland and bought one place to stay. And then one day he went and tried to rent them out. And then he became one real investor man. Hey, Simple Passive Cash Flow listeners. This week's podcast is going to be featuring Jeremy Jetkissom from GoCurryCracker.com. Jeremy and his wife, Winnie, they aren't your typical go to the job and work all day folks are kind of like you guys except uh, they're a little bit more evolved at this than the rest of us um if you go to their website their uh, their website's a lot of good information more about travel hacking and living abroad they kind of live a lot similar to like myself where you go to school get good grades get a good job buy the house they worked in tech you know they just saved a lot of money and you know quite frankly they were a little bit cheap by doing this and you know maybe a little bit cheaper than myself you know I personally still like nice things and if you've been kind of following me lately but the Mercedes got totaled a couple weeks ago and I'm just deciding to go and uh, get a bike very similar to Mr. Money Mustache is doing thing these days now it's not about being cheap but it's about being frugal and paying for value and you know for me biking to work I mean it's pretty fun Especially when you get a electric bicycle that goes 20 miles an hour with uh, you barely doing anything. I think this week's podcast is going to be pretty interesting. Again, you know, these guys aren't real estate folks. They're more index funds and living below their, your means. But I think uh, a lot of you guys who I've been talking to in these free calls, you, know, you guys kind of think outside of the box. And a lot of that is, you know, living abroad. Uh, Winnie is from Taiwan. So I think that's where um, Jeremy did the interview from. They were in Taiwan for a little bit. You know, they'll come back to the States. They just kind of do whatever. And, you know, they're not weirdos. You know, they have a kid. You know, they're trying to teach the kid these worldly views and, you know, showing them all different perspectives. This will be one will be pretty fun for you guys. A lot of you guys have been bringing me multifamily deals, which is great. You know, I try to work with guys who are pretty much experience if you have a multi-family deal send it over and i can run it through my analyzer you know if you don't feel like you trust me i can sign a non-circumvent with you guys but as you guys know i'm mostly looking for good deals these days i'm not looking to steal your deal and operate it myself i think we'll bring you into the partnership accordingly again it's got to be a good deal and you know don't think this is an opportunity to you know bring up any deal from under the sun and have Lane teach it to you. That's what the coaching is there for folks who uh, aren't willing to put in the work and learn it themselves. In 2007, I mean, I analyzed at least 150 properties and I didn't really get anywhere. Yeah, that's always on the table. Get my email, Lane, at Simple Passive Cash Flow. And enjoy, guys. Are you absolutely bored at social gatherings because everyone is super passionate about their J-O-B or too shameful to get naked and talk about their finances? Been drinking the Simple Passive Cash Flow Latte? Got your own coffee parcel? And feeling a little lonely? Re-engage with friends by sending them to simplepassivecashflow.com backslash start or text the word SIMPLE to 314-665-1767 to begin the free web course, The Journey to Simple Passive Cashflow, so that they can get back up to speed with financial independence and investing. Again, join the web course, The Journey to Simple Passive Cashflow. Go to simplepassivecashflow.com backslash start or text the word simple to 314-665-1767. Remember, if you don't tell them now about it, who are you going to have a midday lunch with when everyone else is at the day job? Hey guys, this is Lane with the Simple Passive Cashflow Podcast. Please go to the website and sign up for the Huya Deal Pipeline Club to get deals that I get sent across and that I invest in myself. And uh, please do me a favor and go and review the show and, and uh, go on iTunes and give me a review in there. Today, I have Jeremy from Go Curry Cracker. How's it going, Jeremy? Hey, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Lane? Good. So I've been uh, following your guys' blog for a while now. You guys have one of the uh, financially independent in that personal finance blog sphere, and I want to collide the two worlds today. You guys aren't necessary in real estate, but you guys have been doing some pretty cool things with the lifestyle design. Um, so I thought I'd bring, I'd bring you guys on to kind of show a different, um, definitely an example of people who have done it. So um, can you just give people a little background of um, how did you uh, finally decide to be financially independent? How did you guys do it? And then we can kind of go from there. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I was, I was sort of on the normal linear path, right? Like I went to engineering school. 
got a job, bought a house, bought a car, kind of did all the normal stuff. And then I was heads down paying off student loans. It took me like five, six years to do that. And when I kind of got out of that uh, Uber pay down debt mode, I kind of stopped and looked around and went like, you know, this working stuff kind of sucks. I would like the option of doing something different. So I started exploring what options I had. And I found um, a couple people who had you know, retired while well in their 30s and, and lived abroad to reduce expense seed. And now, let's see, about five years ago, my wife and I kind of quit working permanently. We've been traveling more or less nonstop. We paused for a brief while when our, our son was born, about two and a half years ago. He's now been to 28 different countries. And uh, yeah, this is, we're kind of living our dream and uh, plan on, on keeping that going. Yeah, so let's kind of go back to maybe help us understand the mechanism for getting financially independent. Uh, you know, a lot of people that listen to the show are doing the real estate thing, but I think at the end of the day, you know, it, it comes down to like Kiyosaki says, it's putting making streams of income as opposed to trading time for dollars, right? You know, money's just a tool, right? And you can you can use it different ways. You can you can uh, you can spend it uh, or you can invest it. And we um, we kind of followed the path of hyper aggressive saving mode, right? So we re- kind of ruthlessly slashed expenses. We're living in you know, like a, a small apartment. Um, I I biked everywhere. We we walked everywhere. Like my main transport for two years was a bicycle I bought on Craigslist for 50 bucks and uh, I sold it for 60. So the, the main places where people spend all their money, we just ruthlessly slashed our cost there. And then we took those, those dollars, you know, we were saving something like 70, 80% of our after tax income and uh, used kind of just funneled that into uh, the stock market. At one point, you know, kind of the dividend income started paying our bills. At that point, we were basically saving my entire paycheck. When it really became obvious that we had enough, we just kind of cut the plug on the on the workplace and took off. So were you guys putting the maximum into the 401k and, and was it that extreme of a saving? So we were putting the max in the 401k uh, plus traditional IRAs plus an HSA and then also saving uh, in after-tax accounts. Yeah, so at, at the uh, income minus expenses, what were you guys figuring your, your saving at the end of the year, every year? Um, let's see here. So I was pulling in like 135K or something at the end. And so we were, you know, maybe a third of that was tax. And so we were saving about 100K, uh, 80 to 100K a year. Wow. A lot of the younger guys will call me and, you know, we'll talk about this. And I always say you either fall in one or two camps that kind of like what you guys did. And I, I think I fall in that category where you put your, your nose to the grindstone, you save like no other and you buy rentals or you buy, you know, you invest it like crazy and you get yourself out of the rat race in a very short period of time, you know, a few years or five years or less. But, um, you know, yeah. a lot of people out there have a, you know, they, they have that YOLO attitude of, you know, they're going to create their lifestyle today. But I keep telling them, you know, yeah, you'll get there, but it'll be like 10 to 15 years. I mean, it's a choice and, and there's a lot of leeway in between. But I mean, what, what's your thoughts on, you know, a newer, younger person, you know, they're just starting on the workforce. Is that the only two options that there is? When you look at just raw savings, right? Like if you're saving something like 10% of your income and you decide that, you know, I want to take a year off. Right, like that, that, that's if that's your simple goal, it takes you something like nine years to save enough to, to cover your expenses for a year, right? But if you save half, you know, you only have to work one year to save enough to cover your expenses for a year, right? And if you can save something more like 75%, uh, after one year, you could afford to take three years off, right? And so it, it's, a, it's a very uh, slippery slope, I guess when you decide, oh, I'm just gonna spend a little bit more. I'm gonna spend a little bit more. You know, and you go from something taking three years to support a year of cost of living to five to 10 to where most Americans are saving less than 5% of income, like 50 years. So when you decide like, oh, I'm gonna take, take a vacation now, or I'm gonna take a, 
uh, I'm going to have like a, a weekly alcohol binge with my friends, the bars, you know, or I'm going to buy that new car. What you're really doing is you know, you're not having like short term joy or, or experiences at no cost. You're trading like years of your life of opportunity. So I, I think for the people who are coming directly out of school, if it's anything like my college experience, you're basically used to spending no money. Right, you're used to living like that that poor college student life with ramen and you know and so on. If that kind of lifestyle is uh, uncomfortable for you, if you can slog that out for like two or three more years, well, not now you've built the base upon which you can have your vacations and your alcohol binges with friends and your new cars without trading any of your time. And that's that's the choice you're the choice you're facing. The Hui Deal Pipeline Club is a free investor club where we work together to crowdsource deals and do due diligence together. Most members in our group graduate to passive investors, but some investors who I've built a relationship over the past few years have graduated to active operator status. To back our own members in something that they have found their true calling in, I'm rolling out simple passive cash flow lending. Learn more at simplepassivecashflow.com backslash lend or text the word money to 314-665-1767. Again, for more information, check out simplepassivecashflow.com backslash lend or text the word money to 314-665-1767. All right, well, let's switch gears a little bit for the, um, I guess the, the, the guy who normally listens to the show is probably in their 40s, you know, they've got younger kids and they tell me, Hey man, like, I just can't do the ramen thing. <laughs> like how I used to do my bachelor days. Right. You know, pe- the kids want things, the the spouse wants things. Their career is kind of taken off at this point, right? They're making a hundred, 200 grand a year. How did you guys view the lifestyle creep? You know, I mean, you guys, you guys had the passive income coming in. You guys essentially got financially free. How did you guys really like engineer your, your lifestyle after that point when you were, you were free and then, but you wanted, you know, you, you deserved it at that point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in, we, we reached the point where we no longer um, had to make the trade-offs, right? Like the, the dollars were enough to cover the, the needs and the wants. But prior to that, we really kind of practiced an active way of designing life to minimize costs. Right. So we chose our housing to be in a location where we, we really didn't need, say, a car. Right? Therefore, uh, we just eliminated all car expenses and we walked and biked everywhere. And when, when walking and biking was easier than driving and when the driving was never an option, you just never, never even considered like, oh, I'm, I'm going to just drive over to the grocery store. Like we just walked. It was a block away. And then. For things like, say, dining out, right? people spend a lot of money on, on food and alcohol. My wife took a very active approach to reaching the point where she could cook such that like our own kitchen was the best restaurant in town. Why go out to eat? Why pay 50 bucks for brunch for a couple eggs when you could have something that tastes as good or better at home for like a buck? And when we had... Um, say friends, you know, we're like, let's go out to dinner together. Like that's our kind of our entertainment and, and socializing. You say, that's great. We can go to that restaurant. It would be fun. Or you can come to our house, you know, and we'll have, we'll have dinner here. And they're like, oh, Winnie's cooking? Like, oh yeah, we'll be there, right? And then things like vacations and, and so forth, we basically use credit card sign-up bonuses. And, and I, I was traveling for work, so, you know, the frequent flyer miles and such that came there. You know, we just travel hack everything. So you know, we had sort of a honeymoon in Hawaii that was free. We did uh, multiple, multiple trips where, you know, at least the flights and part of our hotels were free. And we were able then to go from, you know, saving the 10, 20% of income to that 70 plus percent. Yeah. A couple of things I gather from your, uh, you know, just the words that you use, you know, the active and I call it the opting in lifestyle. You know, you, you consciously choose what you're going to spend your money on and what kind of lifestyle yeah. you have. I, I know a lot of guys, you know, they, they kind of think of the, the biking, you know, they, some, for not, some people it's not practical, but something you guys do, you guys have been traveling, living, living outside of the country a lot. 
maybe talk to us about that and how how that decision came to be. Because I know a lot of people they they say, well, it'd be nice to live in Japan for a few months of the year and just kind of get out of yeah. here. For somebody who's basically living off of a stock portfolio, one of the biz- biggest risks you have is that your early year expenses kind of drain the portfolio too fast. Right? And so we decided that even though our goal was that we could support our desired lifestyle in Seattle, where we were living at the time, right, that we wanted to spend substantially less. So we, rather than say kind of living large in Seattle or starting our world travel by you know, spending six months in Paris or Tokyo or something, we, we went to Mexico, we went to Guatemala, we went to Thailand, right? and we were basically able to sort of live like royalty, you know, three, you know, eat out three meals a day, go out for drinks with friends, um, go to the spa, you know, live in kind of like a, say, apartment with a private pool. You know? And we were spending like fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars a month. Okay? Like we pay more for rent by arbitraging where we lived, you know, by moving about in different geographies where the cost of living was lower, we were able to keep a really high standard of living for next to next to nothing. So at that point you had quit the job and you were living, did you have that primary residence in or renting in Seattle or did you get rid of that? Yeah, we, we were renting and uh, we, we planned to be renters for life. We enjoy the renter lifestyle. So uh, yeah, we just, Moved out of our apartment, handed the keys to the landlord, sold everything we owned. We have like two boxes in a friend's basement still with some paperwork that could just be shredded. We just left with what we could carry on our back. I totally agree with that lifestyle too. I mean, I think the biggest mistake a young couple can make is buy that first primary residence and now you're strapped with this three or $4,000 mortgage and you just blew out your, yeah. your first uh, opportunity to buy a rental or invest in the stock market if that's what you so choose especially with the sort of the mainstream advice you get for you know, buy the biggest house you can afford and yeah you, you'll want four bedrooms someday so buy it now and you know, so it's um it could be a really heavy kind of headwind a big burden to place on somebody really ignoring just the financial implications it also reduces your flexibility tremendously like, you know, if you get a new job offer uh, you know, that would be a two hour commute from this place you bought, you know, that you kind of have to really consider just turning it down. Whereas if you were a renter, you just hop up and move, you go where the financial opportunities are. All right, exactly. So how long were these first few trips to some of the cheaper countries? How long were those trips? And I mean, at that point you're still kind of trying it out, right? Yeah. So, so we, um, we had this vision, right? Like the first year we were going to go th- you know, start in Mexico City. That was our where our first flight was destination, and then uh, we figured for the free, for the whole year we would go through all of Central and South America. But nine months later, we were still in Mexico, so <laughs> we sort of uh, decided, you know, like we have like about a sixty year vacation going here. There's really no no reason to rush, and we were having a great time in Mexico, so we just went slow. So we did about. Say uh, nine months in Mexico, several months in you know, Guatemala and Belize, and then we did something like six months in Southeast Asia. We stopped to have a kid in Taiwan, where my wife is from. And then the last couple of years, we've basically been doing about four months in Europe, a couple of months in the U.S., and then um, you know, five-ish months in, in Asia, and just kind of doing the the circumnavigation with the weather patterns. Yeah, so then the, the kid came along. How did that change the, uh, the movement patterns? You know, we, we actively planned the, the family, right? Like, um, he's a test tube baby, right? So we kind of engineered the whole thing. So we had plenty of time to plan and think about it. You know, and we just figured, like, similar to our changing plan for, for Mexico, you know, well, we kind of like it here and we like where we are, like let's slow it down. And so we knew with him, it would add some complications, but we didn't know what they would be. You know, we're new parents. So we tried it. We'd, we'd uh, hang out in a place for a month and think, do we like it here? Should we go to the next place? You know, how's the kid doing? And then we'd go to the next one. And probably the main thing that's changed is we've just planned more in advance. Right? Like we used to just show up 
at the end of a flight or a, a long bus ride and, and be like, well, I guess we need to find a place to, to sleep, right? And now we, you know, we want something in advance. Um, we want to know where we're going to be. We want to make sure that, that there's opportunities for you know, like a safe place for, for a kid and so on that we wouldn't necessarily worry about if it was just the two of us. Yeah, so I, I think uh, guys at home are probably thinking, okay, this sounds like a good lifestyle, but maybe some of the the barriers are, you know, how do you guys make friends? Or you know, at some point when you're traveling, you kind of just get, you, it's just the two of you guys talking to each other, especially if it's the only, you know, the foreign language. So we, we both have, we both have blogs and my wife's a, a published author. And through that, we've actually met a great number of people. And, and uh, we'll get emails like, hey, I, I saw from your Instagram that you're in like Chiang Mai, Thailand. And we are too. Like, can we hang out? You don't know who you're going to meet on the internet. So we always kind of filter through like, yeah, we'll meet for coffee. And then if, it, if you're cool and we're cool, like we'll go from there. And so we, we've met a lot of people that way. But then also if you're just say like Seattle is kind of known for like the Seattle chill, you know, that people are like, you're really nice, but I have enough friends. And and people are busy with their life, so they, they kind of don't really want to maybe invest in new relationships as much. But when you meet um, sort of like that random other person in whatever you know new town that you're in, in the, like in a new culture, um, they're kind of out of place as well. And so you can form these like really quick kind of you know deep friendships with people that you wouldn't be able to do back home. Yeah, that's I guess I, I I've seen the same thing. The Seattle freeze. And I, I just yeah. see it as like, you know, people in general, like some people you meet there, you're not on the quite wavelength. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you and I, Jeremy, we both agree that like working the day job kind of sucks. Right. So we have that common viewpoint. Yeah. I mean, certain people just, I just can't, the wavelengths just yeah. don't match up and you don't really jive. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like if you run into somebody and they're backpacking through, you know, like rural Mexico or something, you know, like, you know right away that you've made somewhat or that you, you at least have a lot of commonalities because you've made those decisions. Like I'm going to leave the workplace. You know, I'm going to go into a place that other people call dangerous and I'm going to experience new cultures. So you already have like at least that adventure streak in there to build something. I recently came back from kicking the dirt in the high elevations in Panama, the site of the investment I am proudest of in my personal holdings, which is Turnkey Coffee Farmland Parcels. Coffee, cash flow, and a legacy investment with turnkey management. Go to simple passive cash flow backslash coffee to get a parcel in your mind before the whole mountain is gone. So you guys have some pretty uh, pretty popular blogs. I, I mean, I, I would consider that like you guys are traveling abroad, and I would I would say it's very similar to a lot of people are having their own startups or you know they're pretty remote. They don't have to go into an office. How did you guys, you guys are, are in these awesome locations. How did you guys find that work-life balance between, you know, going to the beach or just drinking out of a coconut and getting your work done? Was it scheduling or what, what, what was your secret there? Um, a big piece of it is like we don't really have a great work-life balance, right, for the, for the purpose of getting things done, right? Like we're more on the life side of things there are months that go by where I don't do anything, right? Like nothing that would be considered traditionally productive. There are also, you know, after a period of time of sort of sloth, you know, or inactivity or kind of hedonistic living maybe, I get an urge to actually do something. And then I'll go through like a spurt of productivity. And uh, when that's run its course, then I go back to uh, sort of the, the, uh, the travel uh, backpacker life. But I think in general, that, that probably fits around like say six months of travel you know, or, or, or adventure seeking and maybe three months of uh, sort of work and productivity and then maybe three months of maybe like rest and reflection. Right. I mean, it, it all, all comes down to your big why, right? I mean, it's, I mean, you're a, you're a high performer, so at some point you get, like you said, you get nervous, and you got to do something productive, and put something yeah. on the blog that's worthwhile and that, yeah. that adds entertainment value to people. Yeah, I generally like um, I'm a big reader, 
and they, they kind of follow the um, the Charlie Munger you know sort of philosophy that you you enrich yourself through through reading and reading as much as possible. And that generally drives me to create something. Right? So I'm I'm reading whether it be like a book or blogs or you know, something on, online because I'm trying to figure something out. I'm trying to learn something. And then when I find a hole, right, like uh, I can't find the exact sort of information I want in one place, or I see a unique way of looking at something that I, that I haven't seen anybody else write about it, then I'll, then I'll, I'll write based off of that. And so it's just a, it's just a cycle. Like my leisure time is kind of focused on reading and then I find a hole, I create, and then that kind of spins back in, into the, the reading again. So if you were to think about like the world rotating and this is kind of the cycles, where is, where are you, where is this whole thing going? Where is your, the big goal leading to? Are you trying to grow the, that nest egg bigger to have a little bigger lifestyle? Where's this all kind of heading? Yeah. That's a really good question. We are basically working on uh, now child number two. You know, like most of our focus is actually more towards uh, kind of nurturing the family. I, I don't spend near, hardly any time anymore on kind of growing the finances. It's all on autopilot. Because we're, we're working on uh, growing the family, right? we're, we're in one location now. Right? So we're in Taipei. My wife's basically working on painting and music. And I am I'm biking quite a bit and uh, playing the guitar. And so we're, we're basically taking a lot of things that kind of as a child that we like doing that along the way we sort of either rejected as like, oh, you can't make money doing that or sort of, you know, family or parents or someone of influence says, oh, you, you can't build a career on that. Don't, don't go that route, go somewhere else. So we're kind of going back and tapping into our own childhood and kind of pursuing just those creative and, and uh, playful kind of interests that we had that are not money related. Cool. What would be your one advice that you would give to that person who's stuck in the day job? They're building up their cash flow number and they're, they're, they're getting, you know, pretty high up there, five, six, seven, eight, maybe even $10,000 a month, but they just can't get, they just can't let go. Any advice to those kind of folks just kind of stuck in it and not really looking to take the lead? Yeah. There, I think there are two types of people that are in that, in that situation. One of them is afraid, afraid of the, you know, do I, am I actually financially secure? And then there's the one that is, they don't have a thing that they're moving to, right? They might, they might maybe dislike their job, but they don't have something that, that they love that they're aiming to. They're not, they're not running to something. And so generally speaking, I, I like the phrase, like a life lived in fear is a life half lived. Right? Like if fear is holding you back, you need to understand psychologically where that's coming from and nip it, nip it at the bud, perhaps jump. And if you don't have something that you love that you're driving towards, um, you need to find that because that's really what the spark of life comes from, right? It's like finding, finding your joy and finding your purpose. I just want to really highlight what you said right there. I mean, everybody's afraid of taking the leap. But then, like you said, like two kinds of people, either people who have figured out what they're going to jump to or people have no clue what they're going to do. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. And, and it's like for the, for the most part, you know, I mean, like, like we'll get the question like, oh, like, what do you do all day or oh, retirement? Like, isn't that boring? You know, and I think for the most part, those questions come from people who are more up in years than we are. It, it's like a, They've lived so long following that normal path. And I find that really so much opportunity for kind of personal enrichment and uh, like spiritually, emotionally, that, uh, that you're not able to, to find even one thing to answer the question, what do you do? It's a place to be. Yeah. My thoughts on that is I don't pop people's paradigms. And you know, you have the kind of the same, if people aren't open-minded, I just don't even go there. I don't want to ruin people's, you know, what they've, yeah. what they've kind of placed on their last 10, 20 years of their life working in a job that they don't like, that they trick themselves into liking. Uh, I'm with you on that. There's no advantage to uh, challenging people's beliefs if they're not ready. Uh, like, like people don't change their minds uh, because you provided some information to them. They change it because they're ready. 
Well, nice. Uh, good conversation, Jeremy. Um, do you want to give your contact information out there for people to get a hold of you? Can we yeah, follow sure. you on webs? Uh, so you can find us on uh, gocurrycracker.com. Uh, we're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under Go Curry Cracker. Um, publish all of our photos, all of our stories, all of our expenses. So uh, check us out. Cool. Maybe we'll have you back on here in the next uh, five to 10 years and see where you're, where you're heading off to next. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah, yeah. hopefully, uh, ho- hopefully, I've answered the question about like, you know, what's next will be, uh, will be a lot more exciting at that point. Right. Well, good problems to have, right? <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, pleasure, Lane. Thanks a lot, man. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.